If you have your Bibles, which you should have, turn to Numbers chapter 16. One of the books of the Pentateuch written by Moses up front in your Bible. Numbers chapter 16. Looking at verse 41, reading down to verse 50. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Numbers being one of them. Numbers chapter 16, starting with verse 41, ending at verse 50. If you have arrived at that location, say, I'm ready, Pastor. If you're still trying to drive and arrive, say, wait, Pastor. Amen. And the scripture reads thusly, but on the morrow of all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation and make atonement for them for there is wrath gone out from the Lord the plague is begun and Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation and behold the plague was begun among the people and he put on incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed now they that died in the plague were 14,700. Beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the plague was stayed. The word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of our God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. On this 53rd anniversary of our nurses, I want to preach from the subject, the gap band. The gap band. I'm not talking about the old school band. I know some of you are feeling that vibe right now. But turn to your neighbor, look them in the face on the right side and say, it's time to join the band. Turn on the left hand side, look them in the face and say, I know you can do what's necessary. The Gap Band, the Gap Band. Come on, you're talking to me, baby. Out of the mouth of babes. It is hard today to get people to serve God. To serve God with their whole heart. It's hard today to get people to serve God and God's people without serving themselves. Many people will say they will serve you by praying for you. But quite frankly, so many of us are too busy to stop our lives and even offer prayers for our lives. Come on, Come on, many times we come to church and you tell your friends and others about things that are going on in their life. And they say, I'll pray for you. Yeah. Quite frankly, many of them forget. And don't even get to pray for you. There's a spirit of selfishness that's in uh, the economy of America and in the world. Uh, and it's becoming difficult for people to truly serve God. Yeah. Today's text puts on display the power and calling of intercession and the intercessor yeah. who express purpose is to serve and benefit others. Do I have a witness? You may already know this story, you biblical scholars that are up in this place, but I'm gonna tell, tell it to you anyway. 
Moses was moving through the sun-soaked desert with a caravan of millions of Hebrews who once was enslaved in Egypt. Right. They were now free, heading by foot, bearing the burden of Egyptian artifacts to the promised land through an unforgiving wilderness that is purging, preparing, and pruning them throughout the journey. Uh, the days grew longer, longer, drier, and hotter. The people grew sour, sore, and sinful. Thus, an uprising ensued. Korah and his band of Levites and 250 leaders within the congregation gathered against Moses and Aaron, basically saying to them, you are not the only anointed one in the camp. And we can do what you're doing. And they went further to say, the Lord is working among all of us, so what makes you so special? Moses didn't respond angrily. He responded by falling on his face in prayer. Yeah. And after praying, he got up, invited these rebels of the congregation to stand with him before God and then let God tell them and him who has been set aside for the handiwork of leading God's people. Uh, he told Korah and all who was with him, since you want to take over the priesthood and the leadership, take the censors and function uh, like a true priest. Uh, walk the walk and talk the talk. Stop faking the funk. If you, if you think you all of that in a bag of chips, you can handle this. Uh, uh, then take the censer and function in the priestly role by putting fire in them and incense in them before the Lord. And we will let the Lord choose uh, uh, who is to lead them. The next day came and 250 plus censors were prepared and Korah along with Aaron and Moses uh, and all the rest of the Levites and get gathered uh, at the tabernacle door. And the Bible says then the glory uh, of God appeared and God told Moses to get out of my way. He said, get out of my way that I may consume this rebellious faction uh, in a whew, moment. And at hearing this, yeah. all the people fell on their faces and they basically threw Korah and Dathan and Ebram under the bus. <laughs> they said, should we have to perish because of one fool? Right. Uh -huh. right. So Moses declared uh, that the earth would open up, swallow these rebellious souls, and they would drop straight down to hell and the earth would cover them up. Are you hearing me? Uh -huh. And so it was. Uh, Korah, his wife, his children, and the others and their families gathered outside the doorway of each, all of their tents. And the Bible says the mouth of the earth opened wide, swallowed them, and then the earth closed. Now, I don't know about you, but that's enough to get my attention. That's enough to cause me to correct my behavior and understand that I can't function in every function that everybody else is doing. There's a place for my gifts and make sure that I honor uh, the things that God is doing in the midst of his congregation. But uh, it picks up right at the text on verse 41, which says, after they saw what happened to Korah and those who were raising up against Moses and Aaron, the next day, all the same congregations that saw Korah uh, get killed came back the next day complaining to Moses that you killed those people. They crazy, y'all. They, they, they were crazy. They, they were like a lot of us who don't learn lessons on the first time around. Uh, but, but we got to be taught again and again. And so Moses and Aaron, uh, they, didn't, they didn't reflex. They didn't front. They didn't try to challenge them. They didn't try to fight them. The Bible says Moses and Aaron turned toward the tabernacle. And God came out and told Moses, move away or separate yourself from this congregation. And they fell on their faces. Then Moses screamed, Aaron, take the censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it out quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For the wrath of God has come out from the Lord and the plague has begun. Are you all with me still? Mm. And the Bible says, Aaron, who by the way of all the elders was around 100 years old, that brother took off. 
The Bible says Aaron, Aaron took off running so fast. Uh, he took off and ran uh, uh, in the midst of the congregation where the plague had already begun to take people out. At 100 years old, uh, he, he was flying and he ran out there and made atonement for the people. And then the text says he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague took out 14,700 people. But it could have took out millions of them. So the picture of Moses and Aaron as compassionate leaders who had humility, love for the lost, burden for the marginalized, and the passion for God is portrayed as an intercessor. Stay with me now. Because this is the War Room series and we're talking about prayer. This is a picture of an intercessor, one who stands in the gap between the dead and the living. Uh, an intercessor knows that there are many people who are the walking dead, who are lost, blind, never been redeemed, never been saved, never been sacrificed, sanctified, never, never uh, had an opportunity to hear the gospel. There's a lot of people walking dead and in your families, uh, in your neighborhoods, on your job, in your community. There's a walk and an intercessor stands between the dead and the living. Do I have a witness? And so, for clarity purposes, I've got to rewind a little bit to make sure you understand censors and incense and what all this is going on in the text. Uh, can I give a little bit of history, a little bit of lesson to help you for a minute? Because uh, I think it would help open up the text in a little bit different way for you. Uh, the censors with the incense. Uh, I told you many times before that God's holy tabernacle was uh, constructed in three parts. Uh, the outer court and the inner court and the holy of holies. Remember I told you that? And I even told you that the, hum the, the human anatomy, the, the ontological essence of humanity is designed just like the tabernacle. You have a body, outer court, you have a soul, that's an inner court, and then you have a, a spirit, uh, that's the holy of holy, and you can't worship God without only to worship him in spirit and in truth. Everybody understand with me? Your greatest worship has to come out of your spirit. And quite frankly, the Holy Ghost will help you with your worship. Because the Holy Ghost dwells in the believer, keeps the believer from the power of sin. But the Holy Ghost job is also to spark your worship. So if you think that the Holy Ghost is going to sit quiet and watch uh, uh, you just sit there and, and, and fold your arms. But if he's really inside of you, he'll make some noise through you and begin to lift up because he's, he's lifted up himself. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are co-equal uh, in, in the spirit. And so he has to uh, uh, say something uh, to the Father and the Son. He can't keep quiet. Uh, and so if you all uptight and you and your lips are poking out and you not worshiping, there may not be a Holy Ghost on the inside. Preach Pastor Maxwell. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. It. And so the Old Testament blueprint of tabernacle was divided in those three areas, which I told you. And each one of those areas were equipped with specific pieces of furniture for specific purposes. And so the path of God's presence required the high priest in the Old Testament to move progressively from the outer court. Uh, just come down here. Here's the outer court. Uh, the priest would come in the outer court, and he would move progressively to the Holy of Holy, where the pulpit is. And he had specific things he did as he came through. And once he got under the veil with the Holy of Holy, there were furnishings there waiting for him to process toward the presence of God. Basically, you can't just come to God any just kind of way. There, there, there is a process that you have to go through to prepare. A lot of us, we just jump into prayer, but we don't think about how we're coming. And that's why the scripture told us uh, when Aaron's sons uh, later worshiped God, uh, uh, they, they were killed because they had strange fire. They offered strange fire and unclean hands to God. Uh, you, you, you can't treat God. You can't treat God cheap. There's a way to be in his presence. Uh, you have to bow down to worship him. You must decrease so he can increase. Uh, you got to repent and come clean. Be honest with yourself. Tell God what you're doing. And here it is. And you can't be prideful. I, I, I'll preach on that in a minute. You can't, you can't be prideful. And so the progression, look at, look at me now, the progression that goes through, uh, you come in under the veil, and right there, the brazen altar is right there as soon as you open it. The brazen altar is where uh, uh, they crucify or, or sacrifice the blood of the lamb. 
And so it represents the cross in the New Testament. Uh, so you got to go through the cross to get to the best thing. And then uh, you move from the brazen altar to the brazen lava uh, for the cleansing and washing of your hand. After you had dealt with all that blood, then you got to clean all that blood off you. Uh, uh, not, to, not to take away the power of the blood, but to affirm the power of the blood. And so you got to clean your hands and, and wash you, uh, your hands. And, and then you move to the golden lampstand with seven golden candlesticks signifying the Holy Spirit in seven dimensions. Uh, wisdom understanding, knowledge, counsel, might, holiness, and the fear of the Lord. And so those are things, if the Holy Spirit is in you, uh, you should have some wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, might, holiness, and the fear of the Lord. If the Holy Spirit dwells in a believer and keeps the believer, you ought to have some wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, might, holiness, and the fear of the Lord. And then the priest moves from the, the candlesticks and moves to the shoe bread. Mm -hmm. uh, and with, with 12 loaves of bread signifying 12 uh, tribes of Israel who know that bread of heaven feed me too I want no more. Uh, that, that God prepares a table even in the presence of his enemies. Uh, and that table is manifested at the Lord's Supper. Lord have mercy. Uh, and, and then they move to what is called the altar of incense. And this Right here is the point of the sermon. Arriving at the altar of incense where fire continuously burns on the altar without stopping ever represents worship and prayer and praise. Worship, prayer, and praise. And for our teaching today, Aaron, uh, if you remember in the text, he picks up the censer and the censer is like a, a pot with arching handles on and you grab the metal handle and a pot swings in between. You see the picture? Uh, and you take the censer and you go to the uh, brazing altar, the fiery altar, and you take off the coals and you put them uh, in uh, the censer. Uh, and, when, and when you put them in the censer uh, and you put some incense in it, uh, uh, a sweet smelling savior offering unto the Lord. Uh, you put that inside, uh, what you're saying is, is that God, I, I, I've gone through the cross. Uh, I, I've, I've gone uh, uh, through a cleansing process. Uh, I, I, I've been pruned and, and, and I, I've been plucked and I've been turned around. I, I've gone and I now receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I have the gift of God in me. Uh, and so I recognize, I come to a knowledge uh, uh, that, that you feed me every day. You are my daily bread. Uh, and then I recognize God uh, that, that, that I can't do anything else but to praise you for it. Uh, but I can't just praise you. I, I, I got to praise you as a sweet smelling offering. But I need some fire uh, to, to offer up the offering. And the fire uh, is my prayer. Are you with me? Is my prayer. And so we now can glean some precepts and principles from the text. Can I open it real quick? Yeah. Uh, first of all, everyone can function in the place or position that God designates for another. Amen. Don't trip, don't trip. Because there's a lot of people who's in church and in places that always think that they can do everything leaders can do. But somebody say, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Because it's a dangerous thing to get in a place and, and want to be even in the first chair or the second chair or anywhere or on the diaconate. Just easy. No, everybody can't be there. And so you can get killed playing with the things of God. There are some things that are holy. You better not mess with them. Preach, Pastor Maxwell. Some things are holy. And so there's, there's people who say, uh, I'm just like that brother. I put my pants on just like that brother. But God puts an anointing on that brother or sister, and it don't mean it's on you. <laughs> Preach, pastor. And so the text is trying to tell you, even though you got giftings, you may not have the anointing. Even though you have giftings, you may not have the appointment. And most of the reasons why, pride. Because it becomes all about you. Preach, Pastor. And God can't stand stuck up, prideful people. God can't stand it. He can't stand everything that happens. You, you got to be in the front of it. Preach, Pastor Maxwell. You got to decrease so God can increase. In fact, you should do what you do and hide because if you got what you deserve or I got what I deserve, we all would be filthy. 
we all would be messed up. None of us deserve it. Only because of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me will he even allow me a gangster to even serve in the church. So if you keep pushing yourself up, God's going to keep taking you down. Lord, have mercy. Oh. And so we're learning something from the scripture that there's got to be, y'all can write this down real quick, consecrated, contrite, compassionate people who are leading. Moses and Aaron are displaying these three attributes, consecrated, contrite, because God loves a broken and contrite heart. And compassionate people. You may have compassion, but if you don't have contriteness, or if you don't have a contrite heart, you ain't flowing the way God's flowing. But the good news is this. God will take your compassionate heart and work you till you go through a process till he break you. That's happened to Jacob. Jacob, who would become Israel one day. He, he had a, he's a trickster. He was a hustler like I was in days of old. And he would always get what he wanted. He would edge and move people out. He would manipulate. He would do anything to get what he wanted. But God had to take a hold of him. The Bible says he wrestled with the angel all day long and came out with a limp. Uh, I'd rather come out with a limp with God than to hang out in the world. Uh, sometimes God will break you and will cause you to limp but it's good to be uh, in the presence of the Lord coming out limping because if you limping for the Lord come on I, 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 Lord I'm limping for Jesus I'm alright anybody got a little brokenness in them anybody got a little brokenness in them God he has to make a contrite heart and see in the text Moses and Aaron could step back and allow God's judgment to continue to fall and wipe out all the people. Uh, I don't want to see you. I wouldn't want to be you. You got yourself in that mess like my mama said. You bad enough to get yourself in that mess? I can't say the rest of it. Yeah. Y'all finish it for me. I know you got it. But because of their crazy love for the people, their hearts broke. And Moses and Aaron uh, went into the crowd to seek atonement for God. Aaron, run! Run in there. Aaron could have said, oh, Moses, you tripping. <laughs> Run where? Where the plague is? That's killing people, wiping out all these people? Run to the plague? Why don't you run, Moses? <laughs> but no, he, he, he didn't do that. His, his heart was motivated for love for his people. Don't let people tell you to love our people is a problem. We need to learn how to love our people so much we be willing to run to the plague to fight for their lives. And so, by lighting the censer and running in the mist, Aaron became an intercessor before God and for his people. And so the heart of a true believer will cry out, I will either live with the living or die with the dying, but I must do something. I can't sit by while they keep killing my men in the street. I can't keep uh, sitting by while they keep manipulating and, and hurting our women. I, 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 if it's going to cost me to die, I'll run in the midst of the plague that I make somebody live again, have hope again, to believe again. But it's going to take a sacrifice to go through it. Lord, 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 Jesus. Moses and Aaron were consecrated, contrite, compassionate, and they worshiped the Lord thy God. Now, there's a picture in scripture about uh, the sons of Eli, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, who wanted uh, God to do all kinds of things for them, but they didn't want to do the right thing with God. That was a strange fire text. I said the wrong one earlier. They worshiped with unclean hands, but Samuel was raised up by Eli as a gift from Hannah and grew in favor with God because he was a God chaser who was humble and contrite. And so you see in this text a constant display of humility, contrition turning to the face of God. You see these leaders, Moses and, 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 and Aaron, compassionate and truly caring for the people. And so when you read 1 Peter 2 and 9, write it down, 1 Peter 2 and 9, it gives you a New Testament picture of what I'm talking about here in the Old Testament. The scripture says, but ye are a chosen generation. Yeah. He's talking to you. Yeah. A royal priesthood and a holy nation. A peculiar people that ye should show forth his praise of him who have called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Then go on to say which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have, uh, but now have attained mercy. 
Daily I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims that you are. You're in the world, but not of the world. Uh, but abstain uh, from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that they be, by your good works, by your good service, they shall behold the glory of God. And so we today, to be in the gap as intercessors, we got to do good works with praise and prayer being lifted up. Number two, the text is right there. Look at verse 42. You have to call the plague for what it is. Yeah. Call the plague for what it is. Stop denying it. Stop renaming it. Stop perpetuating it. To rise up as a chosen generation, we may have to repent put a stay on the sin, the sin effects. Uh, uh, sin tries to infiltrate. It tries to invade our lives. Uh, it kills, steals, and destroys. But we have to call a spade a spade and overcome the opposition with compassion. Yeah. We must call the plague for what it is. Yeah. You know there's a plague out there. You see the carnage and the fallout. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper, watch TV, and you will see the plague. When you see men who rape children and videotape it for their pleasure, there is a plague. When you see young people so tormented by pain and depression that they walk in schools and randomly shoot people, there is a plague. When you see illegal drugs becoming legal for profit, not for us, but for others, there is a plague. When you see police forces militarizing themselves with tanks and big guns walking through our neighborhoods and our streets, there is a plague. When you see crazed racists come into Bible study, study with the parishioners, then gun them down one by one, there is a plague. When you find out that a middle school board deems that it's appropriate to hand out birth controls to sixth graders, there is a plague. And when the homeless stand on every corner and the church folk pass by, there is a plague. When the hospital rooms are filled with disease and sickness, and where is the power and the healing, there is a plague. When churches condone all acts of immorality and lead their congregation into addiction and destroy their testimony, there is a plague. There is a plague in the world, and we live in it. It's spreading. It is claiming lies. It is causing casualties. And in fact, we cannot ignore it. We must acknowledge it and deal with the plague. Call a plague for what it is. Third, call out for cover. Verse 42 said, when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tabernacle of beating, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. I love the text because Moses and them, even after being dissed, disrespected, slammed in their face in front of all the people, they didn't go in their flesh. The Bible says they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Where you turn will determine your destiny. If you turn on your adversary, you may get killed. Uh, if you turn on your family, because we take a lot of our frustrations that we can't deal with out there and we bring it back home, that's what domestic violence is all about. Uh, we, 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 where you turn will determine your destiny. And some of us got to say something and come out of our faith and wriggle our neck because we, we ain't going to deal with you coming in my face. But sometimes you need to shut your mouth and turn toward God. Be quiet and let God Deal with your enemies. Let God deal with it. I know you bad. I know you you anointed. I know that you're special. But sometimes you're provoking more wrath than needs to be had. And so you got to allow God to have his way with you. Who am I preaching to right now? God, help me to keep my mouth closed. The Bible says they turn toward the tabernacle of meeting sometimes you got to be able to turn toward the church but the church need to be a praying church uh, if you're turning toward church and we ain't praying don't come don't don't be part of it because this this house has to be a house of prayer and some people been asking are, are y'all a, a part of a a move or a, a, a what do they call that word uh, when everybody's following what's going on right now you know 
not even a cult, but just a trend or, 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 or a move. Y'all all into war room? No. Before war room came, we were doing three, three prayers up in this house. We have done shuttings up in the house. We're not, we're not moving because war room. We're moving because God said move. And we're in agreement with war room because we know that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal this land. Uh, we can do all the preaching we want. We can do all the singing we want. But if we don't do no praying, uh, ain't nothing really going to happen. We got to seek the Lord's face. day. why? We got to seek his face. And we got to get real. Not just pray by yourself. There's something dynamic about us coming together and crying out. I believe we can change all of our homes, our families, and our future if we come together and pray together and cry out together and change the world together. Change the world together. They turned to God's house and God's presence and they were displaying to us how to do war. We must turn to the presence of God, to God's people, to God's presence. And the glory of the Lord will come like a cloud and cover you. I don't know. but I've been covered. Uh, you, you know, I, I was a kind of, uh, as a kid, I liked blankets. Some of you, you know, really like blankets. You, you twist it in and put your thumb in your mouth kind of blankets. You kind of like the feel of blankets. Anybody like the, just the feel of blankets? and cloth. There's some of them that's thick and really good. You know, when you go to a real good Marriott and get under a real good that's right, cover. That's right, that's right. Woo! And you see, I, I, I have to have cold space in my bed. Hallelujah. I, I don't like hotness, so I, I like to have a space. So I'll move to this side, wait till it get cold, roll over to it. And then wait, that will get cold and roll back to that one. Uh, see, some of us are sensitive to coverings. We, we need cover. Even in the middle of the summer, you still got to have a piece of cover on you. Oh, y'all feeling me now? But this word right here is trying to let you know uh, there, there, are, there is a real covering that can happen in your life that can change everything. Yeah, yeah. It's when you've, been, uh, when you've been before the Lord with your face uh, bent toward the ground uh, like flint and you're crying out for God and you're not playing. You, you, you're going to stay there till, till a breakthrough come. Uh, there's a cloud that comes uh, and covers you and keeps you in the nighttime. Uh, I, I know this because even me and you and some of us in this room know we've done something that didn't deserve to be covered but God covered it anyway thank you God for covering me when I was stupid thank you God for covering me when I was crazy thank you God when I was acting a fool you covered me uh, you, you kept me uh, you let your cloud come by and keep me because you knew what my destiny was about you knew who I was going to become God will cover you in spite of you when your real heart is in the right place Oh, I'm preaching to somebody. Go ahead and shout, mama. Go ahead and shout. God will cover you when your heart's in the right place. God will do it when your motivation is right. Anybody here been so covered and you got out of there and you said, Whoa, Lord, thank you. I know that was you, God. Aaron, Aaron and Moses turned toward the presence and the house of God. And the glory and his cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord appeared. Number four, I want to find, find this time to let you go. Call up some fire. Call up some fire. Another way to say it, just light up. Just light up. The pastor told you just to light up. Not a joint, not a... Not a blunt, not a cigarette, not a pipe with crack in it, but you're going to have to light up. Call up some fire. You got to light up. You have to take your censer. Get, grab your pot, put fire in it from the altar, put some incense on it, and take it quickly to your families, to the dysfunction in your neighborhood, down your family line. You run to those people that you know in your family that seem that they can't get it right no matter how much you preach to them. Hey, hey, hey. Run into the highways and the byways where the lost is. Run into the shelters. Run into the mental institutions. But, but, but take up some fire from the altar and put some incense and take it to the congregation. The priest's job in the temple was, listen, to keep the fire burning and to never let it stop burning. Whether you know it or not, too many churches has lost their fire. Too many leaders, pastors, preachers have got so religious, 
they don't have no fire. They are empty pots clinging around with no fire from the altar. The fire of God is the spirit of God. And I believe more than ever in my life, in all my years on this earth, I believe more than ever that God's spirit is coming at another place, at another level, to come even to East Friendship, to every house represented by East Friendship, to come to do a new work that we have never experienced. And God is about to take us in another place. And I, the thing is going to be whether you are willing. But if you're going to remain uptight, scared, and mad with God for the rest of your life, you're going to miss your blessing. Preach, Pastor Maxwell. We, we as a church cannot battle for the souls of men and women unless we have the fire of the Holy Spirit burning on the altars of our heart. It's time to light up. Put some fire in your vessel and some incest. The incest is the, the sweet offering that you say, that you, that you give up, where praises go up and truly blessings come down. If you study the Bible carefully, like Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, you will see as praises go up unto the Lord Jesus, the intercessor is right there interceding for you. But he sends, he sends signs of received prayer by lightning. That's in the word. And a lot of us just be watching lightning and run, running. I, I be running too, y'all. <laughs> but the Bible says that lightning has everything to do with an acknowledgement that your prayers have been received. Yeah. And I'm sending you something back. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to deal with that next week. Come there. I'm going to really deal with that next week. Because I want you to understand, praises do go up. That's not a quote in the Bible. We came up with that. But the revelation is when praises and worship goes up, he sends something back down. It doesn't just stay up there. God uh, reciprocates at another dimension and begins to bless you in the field and bless you in the city. He'll bless you a hundredfold. But listen. You got to send out the right kind of praise. If your praise is motivated all about you and you want to be cute in the sanctuary and look at who's watching you, you got the wrong kind of praise. That's tainted, polluted, convoluted kind of praise. You got to close your eyes someday and just cry. Just cry because God got you still here when you know you shouldn't have been here. God got you through the accident. God got you through the drugs. God got you through the abuse. God got you through the homelessness. You ought to... You, you got too full of yourself. You need to put your head back and cry. God got you out of that bad relationship. Got you out of even a bad marriage. Got you out of a lot of hell. You ought to just cry sometime. It's all right to let the tears flow. God's been so good for you. You would have been dead if God didn't step in. You would have never made it if God hadn't brought you out. It's all right to worship him in the beauty of holiness, recognizing the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I thank you, God, for doing that work for me. And so uh, you see in the text, they called on fire. Finally, brothers and sisters, call on the Lord in intercession. Aaron, in verse 47, offered incense, incense and made atonement. Listen here. He got in the gap for the souls who were in desperation and danger. It doesn't mean they deserve it. We don't intercede because people deserve it. We intercede because God is good and he wants souls to be saved. You and I cannot judge the journey of nobody. We can't judge nobody. We all been unclean, undone. With your bourgeois self. Put your nose down and smell your shoes. Lift up your head and praise the God. You can't judge nobody. God wants you to fill the gap for his people who are losing much due to disobedience. And their need, listen, to be like the oppressor. So many of us have taken the Egyptian pharaoh mentality and paradigm and brought it to our neighborhoods. We oppress our women. We oppress our children. We, we carry control systems that want to always put people down. You must be broken. If you don't submit, God will break you. He does not deal. He does not allow oppressors to always keep doing what they're doing. You can't put woman in a box and say you can't preach. If the wind can make a sound unto God, how much more could the woman of God preach the gospel? Uh, Joel says in the last days, I poured out my spirit. My sons and daughters will prophesy. The women of God and the men of God will prophesy because we are the ex 
and Y chromosome on the natural but in the spirit we are together or we are rib and body who can turn the world out when we flow together but too bad too bad too many of us are love with the world we want the hoochies in the world we don't want anointed women and men to journey in our lives we gotta put some of that nasty stuff down and raise up and take us an anointed woman and get a woman and a man who's gonna walk with us in agreement stop wasting time running in the world trying to please yourself you need to go and get you an anointed man sister of God and woman of God get an anointed man man of God get an anointed woman you've been single too long oh I know I'm preaching I, I ain't scared of you you've been single too long and so we have to get in the gap I'm talking about a gap band of people who band together to turn the condition of the world, the society, the church away from the world and become exactly what God says. Are you want to be part of a movement? A gap band who refuse to let death have its last say on our children's life. A gap band willing to put our own lives at risk in prayer. A gap band who stands in between the living and the dead. You see here, Moses and Aaron teach us that we need a gap band. Yeah. A band of men and women, children, who knows how to keep watch. You see, the Morians, Moravians, these great prayer warriors, if we study church history, and we go back in history and we find out how uh, the gospel came to America, you will find the, Mor the Moravians there. The Mor Moravians, that name, mm, they, they, they need to be honored. Because they kept prayer going for a hundred years, 24 hours a day, every day for a hundred years. And every move of the Spirit happened because they were praying. And so when you study the tabernacle and the tent, and you begin to understand that even every movie, it move in church history happened. Yeah, yeah, uh, the blood at the brazen altar was there. And that's where uh, justification of faith came. Because just, we've been justified by the blood. And then you move uh, uh, down the, to the brazen lava, and that's when the holiness movement came, the cleansing uh, of the body of Christ. Uh, and then you get to the candles uh, and the outpouring of the spirit, and then you get the charismatic movement with the operation of the gifts. The whole system of how God is preparing us is laid out there. And now we move down, and we come out, and we're up to a place where the watch has to take over. Because Christ is soon to come. Yeah. And we're in a new season where the church has to become the church that watch and pray. Yeah. To prepare for the coming of our Lord. That we get more serious about the God and do what God wants us to do and not what we want to do. Yeah. Uh, we got to stand in the gap. This generation has a responsibility for all the lost souls of this generation. You, you can't get around it. You can't get under it. You're going to have to do something about it. And so you got to be unafraid of the consequences of prayer and war in the spirit. Who's willing to give their lives and run into the congregation and the community? 42 years ago, 42 generations ago, there was one who came and died for your sins and my sins. He stood in between the living and the dead. He took the death blow of the plague of sin upon his cross and died for you and I. Three days later, rose with all power in his hands. Now sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for all of us continuously. First Timothy 2 and 5 says, one mediator between God and man. That's Jesus. Hebrews 7 25 says wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Romans 8 and 34 says who he that condemneth it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. He is our high priest. He's the one that went down to hell and took the keys from Satan, destroyed the works of sin, rose again with all power in his hands. 
He is in the gap for you and me. He is the one who's the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. He is the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. He is the bishop of my soul, the king of kings and lord of lords. And all that he is, he's in the gap for you and for me. Every time we pray, Jesus is in the gap. Every time we struggle, Jesus is in the gap. In our ups and our downs and our laying down, he's in the gap. And so if he's in the gap up there, we got to be in the gap up here. And so the old church used to say, there's a charge I have. A charge to keep. A charge to keep I have. A God to glorify. A never dying soul to save. Fit it for the sky. To serve the present age. By calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage. To do my master's will. Arm me, Lord, with watchful care. As in thy side to live. And now thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray and still God to rely on thee. Oh, let me not my trust betray, but press to realms on high with thee. A charge to keep and I'm on my business. How about you? Father, I thank you. I pray God as everybody's standing in the house. I pray, God, that you raise up intercessors that are really serious about your work. The church has made a mistake. God, we made a mistake. We list intercession as many times a gift of the Spirit, but it's not listed nowhere in the Bible as a gift. It's a command given to every Christian that we pray, that we pray without ceasing. We pray. Father, I pray today that you raise up gap men, a gap band, gap women, gap children, people who are willing to stand in the gap and understand how to intercede for you, God. You shed your blood that we would have the power to do what we need to do, and now we're not afraid. We're ready. We're ready. And so, God, I pray for this church, each friendship. I pray for the community, every family represented here, that the plague does not spread further because it's been stayed because we prayed. The plague have been stayed because we prayed. The plague have been stayed because we prayed. Father, help us to pray and to trust and obey. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let the redeemed of the Lord clap your hands. Just bless them right now. <laughs>